live. I believe that we should be back and live now. Hopefully there's a bit of confirmation in the chat for Joshua to relay over to us. Hello, hopefully you can hear okay. us. Hopefully uh, we managed to get everything sorted now. It's very tricky. Um, to get all of this done, especially because a lot of us are learning all of this on the fly. I think that even with the difficulties and how bad OBS can be at sometimes, I'm uh, really thankful for Joshua for doing everything that he can to get us going and make sure that we still get a stream, even with a bit of difficulty. Um, and yeah, I believe that we're just going to rewind a little bit just so that we can see uh, that turn one play out again. And it was indeed an explosive turn one. Yes. Thank All right, guys. brilliant. Let's go back into it. Now, with the Kali Iceberg, it's interesting to see who wants to recruit him and who doesn't. I mean, instinctively, you don't think that Tershby wants to be there. And with Bomber having more of the Irish Trickroom style, you think that he wants to be the one setting the pace of the, of the battle with the Trickroom. Oh, obviously, the one with the, the Torko and the Ursaluna probably wants the, the Trickroom to go up. Yeah. No, definitely. We'll see exactly how it plays out. Does the Calyrex actually want to reverse the trick room, calling it, and just let the airship do what it does? That's the other thing that's important to call. Um, so many 50-50s get implemented anytime you have any sort of size spam, hard trick room. And we can see there with Drax taking their time to make the decision, do they want to call it or do they want to go all out? You see the Ndidi is withdrawn, and in its place will come the, uh, I believe it was the Ursaluna. Yeah, definitely. And one thing that we actually noticed was that Drax seemed to actually time out. So this surging strikes actually was very fortunate to come out into that slot. Uh, whether they were planning for it to happen or not, they got the call absolutely right. Um, and it looks as though that is a huge, huge turn one going their favor. And that will be followed up by that glacial lance that will secure that knockout. Yeah, losing your Esaluna so early in the game is an incredible deficit to have to overcome, especially because one thing that I like to think about is Trick Room is hyper offense with an extra step, and to lose any of the turns of your speed advantage is disastrous, especially uh, with something as powerful as the Ursaluna just not contributing to the battle at all. Yeah, losing that chance to just absolutely nuke any target besides the target is a disaster. But yeah, we'll see absolutely. the Torkoal come and replace the Ursaluna slot. And on the Trick Room, Torkoal is a menace, firing off those huge eruptions. Yeah, exactly. Especially with the choice specs. So that, that does provide an interesting wrinkle in that the move actually can't be changed in case it takes any damage. So they really want to go all out really quickly. And the one thing that they do not want to see is Pelipper coming into the battle and resetting that weather into Drax's favor with the rain. And there it is. That's not something you want to see when you're using Torgo. No, absolutely not. Oh, a terror will also come out. Now, what we know from this team is that the terror on the Calyrex is grass, but it's actually the Torgo going all in on all its damage. It wants that extra terror fire damage. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have to see exactly how much this does in the rain. An important note here as well, if this Torgo does take damage, it's going to have that minimum 60 base power eruptions as well. Because of the that is true, fire. because of the terror boost, that is an interesting thing. And that double up does indeed get the power there. Oh, wow. that's oh, a that, huge knockout. That plus one attack is going to be really nice. Exactly. Being able to boost your attack and get rolling is incredibly strong. And the Surgeon Strikes again goes into the Torkoal. A very safe target because of that terror fire. It can't terror into any sort of resistance. And now Bomber is left with Ndidi and Calyrex against the and I believe that it's going to be either the Calyrex coming in or um, an Incineral would be really handy to have here. Well, the Psychic Terrain should still be up, so it can't exactly fake out. Safely. No, that is true. While it can't fake out, though, I believe that um, it definitely wouldn't be as at risk as something like that Rillaboom or the Raging Bolt. Well, we see the Ndidi make a return and the other uh, Calyrex. But this Calyrex, as you may have seen, doesn't have its fourth move for some reason, probably is uh, going to make an impact here. Yeah, you'd love to have something that wasn't a resisted hit, like that Glacial Lance. This Urshifu as well, we're just checking a very smart decision from uh, Drex to be able to check everything that you need 
making sure that you have every single one of your tick room turns under control and in your head is so important for your sequencing to be able to stall it out when you need to and make sure that you have the advantage in the late game. I believe this is the third turn of trick room. I, I believe so too. It's always a bit harder to know when you're not playing in game and it's not on showdown, so it doesn't tell you. Exactly right. Now, even though they've lost a lot of their firepower, getting rid of that Pelipper and getting so much damage onto the Urshfu was incredibly important for, uh, for Bomber and his side of the field. And with that attack boost, there's still going to be a significant amount of damage coming out. Unfortunately, I don't think this Intimidate is going to do anything. A close combat comes out on that Incineroar switching. Oh, that's a great call from Bomber, making sure that he gets enough of that damage down. Uh, the Glacial Lance actually would have been resisted by both targets, so it's interesting that he decided to go for the shore damage, making sure that he goes into that slot. Uh, although he was at risk of a possible detect from the Eshkin. Getting that minus one defense, though, might be a bit scary, in all honesty. No, definitely. I believe that Jack is definitely hoping to have that Incineroar around for more than one turn, but now we'll have to see exactly what they do. I believe there's still two turns of Trick Room Ralph, so this could get a little bit dicey. Uh, this Urshifu does not even have uh, Aqua Jet as well, so it can't get that extra chip. Yeah, and so even if the Psychic if Train like falls away, yeah, there's no way of just getting a last move off. What's going on? We're having like a PowerPoint slide uh, a game here. Yeah, I do apologize. I think the uh, file that came through did unfortunately have a bit of struggle capturing, dropping some frames. I believe we were just going to see another glacial lance from both sides here. I think that's the most likely option. There's not really too much there to do. I think the Indeed itself is helping hand. I'm not sure if Helping Can came out there uh, because of the. <laughs> it does have Helping Can. Helping Can follow me, Spice Shop Trick Room. Well, whether it got off in time, it is definitely not a longer in the field, and it's Calyrex versus Calyrex. And I believe that even if this. Um... Glacial Lance goes in, there'll only be one turn of Trick Room left. I think that Drax will surely be able to just protect and finish it off with yes. one final Glacial Lance single target. Uh, the suspense is killing me personally. <laughs> this is a great image to, uh, to wait on. I, I guess... Uh, I, I, I could assume that Drax won. Uh, <laughs> Skipping those frames there. I think they just wanted to package it in the most efficient way. Just We don't need to see it going down. We knew it was going down. Everyone knows exactly how powerful uh, Glacial Lance is at plus one. I can guarantee you that the Calyrex Ice Rider won that game. That is incredible insight. Thank you. I think that that's what people are paying you the big bucks to say. <laughs> well, oh. looks like we'll be moving on to game two. Yeah, and what, what do you expect to see from Bomber here? Do you expect to see a similar lead? I definitely don't think we'll be seeing that same turn one. Uh, maybe a better utilization of the Saluna. Uh, yeah, it's just painted immediately. So that's never nice to see. And I'm not sure on the Terrifier terrestrialization either. Maybe something else could have been utilized better in this game to survive. Hmm. Yeah, it was interesting because there wasn't really a good uh, terrestrialization threat there because what we know from the team sheets is that on Bomber's side of the field, both the Calyrex and the Indelia Terrorgrass, neither of which you want to be doing in front of that Calyrex Ice, even though you resist the Surging Strikes, that move is cutting glass in Trick Room and that's mm -hmm. definitely not the main threat and that's not really what you want to prioritize. You also have to keep an eye out for that Pelipper still. Even though it didn't practically nothing that game apart from set the rain. It's still a threat with uh, uh, the wide guard option blocking the the eruptions and the glacial lances. Exactly. We saw exactly it, we saw how impactful wide guard Pelipper was in the NASC final in that game three with the unbelievable moment where the Pelipper was revealed in the back. And it had an impact despite not getting an attack off this time. As we see that 
they are indeed going to stick with the same leads. It's Carax Ice partnered by Urshfu on the side of Drax, and it's partnered by Indeedy on Bomber's side. Interesting. Uh, do you think we'll have a similar turn on uh, turnout, or will uh... I definitely don't think that there'll be quite as much risk put in. I think if anything, it should most likely be a follow me trick room. Oh, However, I... you do have that mind game of whether you cancel the trick room. I, I was about to say coaching is an option, and I believe they went for it here. Very true. Yep. Standard follow me trick room on Bomber side of things, and this coaching will be incredibly impactful. Okay, I think that Calyrex is attack and defense. Plus one attack and defense is quite a nightmare on Calyrex Ice Rider. It's already got phenomenal bulk and attack, and just three speed and five one speed, which is enough to uh, make you regret just ignoring it. Yeah, exactly. Questioning all of your life's decisions as you see Calyrex boosted in front of you. The trick room will go up, and then what will be really important is this uh, next turn. Will the carry, will the Urshu just stick in there and continue to coaching boost? It's definitely an option. But uh, you have to think about the turns ahead, because if you let this indeed drop immediately here, then maybe the portal comes in, and then you have a bit of an issue. Yeah, definitely true. And as we see, there's not actually a single target move for Drax because of that team sheet issue. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe we can see a protect come out here just to make sure they don't get that KO. Yeah, exactly. Sequencing your knockouts is just as important as sequencing your protects in this in this kind of situation because you don't really want to let your opponent get free switches and get a full head of steam, especially when that free switch is something like this Torko. We do see the Torko co come in immediately, so I guess flicking Glacial Lance here was optimal. Yeah, and that's something that the experienced trick room player knows is when to punish your opponent's defensive plays and when to just let them knock you out. Every single summon of the sequencing is so important on both sides, and all of the ex most experienced players will take that into account no matter what they're doing, is knowing the turn order, knowing the speed order, and knowing exactly what you can do with each Pokemon at every moment. So I assume Urshifu clicked uh, coaching again here because I, it's still on the field, but we didn't see it come through. Yeah, yeah, with no switch, surely that's a very, very dangerous second coaching. The fact that the Torkoal switched in means that the Pelipper that we know is in the back, uh, probably we're going to see an appearance here. Yeah, definitely. I think you definitely want to protect with the Calyrex if it's me, because you want to scout out this Specs Torkoal. And also, you definitely do not want to let it take any damage. Again, both Calyrex Ices are Terra Grass, which is absolutely the last Terra you want to see when you're facing down what's on the other side of the field. Definitely. And the terror fire from the Torkoal for a second time. Uh, not re really caring about the Pelipper switch in again. We saw last time that the double up was enough to take it out. And they said for the single target close combat into the Calyrex. Okay. We'll probably be seeing a, an eruption here as well to follow that up. Does this mean the Calyrex is slower? In the talk call? Potentially. Uh, okay. I'm wondering if the frames were just skipped. I'm not sh sure, yeah. I I'd assume that the talk was slower. So we probably had an eruption c come out, but we just didn't see it on the screen. No, and this time the Pelipper does make an appearance on the field, having scouted out whatever move happened. And we Terroring. Terror, Interesting. <laughs> Who terrors? <laughs> I'd assume it's the Pelipper because you don't particularly want to turn Terra Grass in front of another Glacial Lance. Yeah, this Pelipper is actually Terra Ghost, which is interesting. I don't believe that that's either of these Terras don't particularly seem like they would be optimal uh, in this situation. It's probably so that they don't target it with the close combat to break its uh, focus section and they can click. Ah, uh, true. Oh, it was the Calyrex that actually turned into Grass. Oh, it was. Okay. Maybe Torkoal locked into a different move we didn't see last turn. Interesting. He might have gone for that weather ball, predicting some damage coming in. And in which case, the Grass Terror could potentially be an incredible option because then you're able to white guard away Glacial Lance and then you resist the weather ball. It is a bit uh, difficult to cast and we ourselves don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's a little bit a little, a little bit tricky, a little bit tricky. But now we see that it's actually the Dark Urshfu is coming out. And this is safety goggles, so not Sash. Well, unfortunately, this Urshfu uh, is still in Trick Room. 
Yeah, it may not be long for this world. I think that it was really popularized by uh, the popular streamer Topo Wapo to use an incredibly slow Ash Fu, but even with that, uh, without an Iron Ball, I don't believe that it's got any chance of moving even second here. Yeah, that's the third arm move for the Pelipper and the Calyrex Shadow. I mean, Calyrex Ice, not Shadow. Uh, Do we see here? Oh, another switch. switch. All right, Ash Fu comes back in. I just see bear. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, it, it, it's, it's the classic situation. You see bear and you freeze. <laughs> I, I would assume the, right. the Pelipper knocked out the Torkoal here with something, probably a weather mm -hmm. ball. Yeah, we can assume that it was either a weather ball or an earth power uh, on the other side from that Torkoal. Did not target the Pelipper, and the Pelipper gets the KO and fully gets in control of the weather. And rain is here to stay. And DD comes to replace the the Torkoal. I'm not sure what the opposing Gershifu did this turn. Maybe it went for a protect or some chip into the Gershifu water. I honestly don't know what happened. I think it might have switched in on that turn. What, was this the turn the Gershifu Dark switched in? I believe so. I'm not 100% sure, to be quite honest yeah, with you. I'm a bit confused. These, these pictures are moving very slowly. Um... Well, I hope our uh, audience is having a, a laugh out with us, at least. <laughs> definitely, definitely interesting. I mean... There are popular PowerPoint presentations about VGC uh, out there on YouTube. I know they're very entertaining. This wasn't necessarily meant to be one, but it's kind of turned into it a little bit. As we see a U-turn from the Ashu into that Indeedy, trying to get some good damage down with a super effective hit and reposition the board, knocking it out and um, putting things back into control for Drax. Yeah, that I... Indeedy was very low from earlier because it took that plus one Glacial Lance because of the Kuchin boost. So obviously, we're well within U-turn range. Exactly, and we'll see that most likely a pivot back into that Calyrex. I would assume so. Or even an Incineroar to take a Wicked Blow. It looks like Pelipper went for a Hurricane into that Oshifu, because uh, I see it's super effective, and <laughs> I, I, I believe that's the only move it could have used in that case. Yeah, I don't believe Pelipper learned Dazzling Gleam in the last uh, day or so, and I think <laughs> that seals the win. Congratulations on Drax. Drax with a really well played set. I believe that they had the potentially had the matchup advantage with the uh, strong NAIC team. Um, Calor Excise versus Calor Excise is really not um, really a difficult thing to manage. They managed to not get baited into setting the trick room for their opponent. They just went ahead, made the sensible moves, and attacked full on. Yeah, so it was a very uh, convincing game one and two, I would say. Especially with the coaching call. I don't know if you see any way that uh, Bomber could really have avoided that. Well, the, the coaching just uh, put such immediate pressure on the board, even into the opposing Calyrex. Still a resisted hit, but it still did a decent amount of damage. Exactly. As we know, that Calyrex is one of the most bulky Pokemon around. Insane defenses, as well as its insane attack set. And to take 35, 40 maybe percent from a plus one Gage Lance is ridiculous damage. And that just proves why this Pokemon is so dangerous and is favored by a lot of the balance players all, uh, all, all, all around the world. We yeah. have and the next match. Ready? Going straight to the next match. And um, this screen might be very familiar to those <laughs> of you who uh, follow uh, the good captain. I think that I really have to applaud him on some incredible branding, putting his entire Twitch overlay onto the stream rather than giving the raw file. Um, definitely would have given Joshua a shock when he uh, realized <laughs> just what he was getting. Um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, Captain Arrow with Simon Iredale, good friend of mine, really enjoyable streams, and I guess that uh, we have a third commentator joining us for this round. Hopefully we get to see some uh, good reactions from them as well. Definitely. And it, we take a look at this. It's Quite clearly, it's the um, Aurelian Sula team. Grimmsnarl, notably, 
Aura's favorite Pokemon. Uh, he's a big fan of it, so it's not surprised to see him go into something like this against Anno, who is John Brotherston, a, another local champion, one in Edinburgh, I believe, just in the last week or so. Uh, so we've got strong players on both sides with uh, Captain Aro having won the Liverpool MSS. It's interesting to note here that uh, there's two fighting types against this uh, Terrapagos team, so how do you think that will sway into who has the think... advantage? I think that puts uh, a lot of fear into uh, Captain Arrow's side of things. John going with the Coridon, which, as mentioned, is truly beloved by the UK scene for reasons that I'm personally not a fan of, but um, I don't, <laughs> but it does get a lot of popularity. We actually see it's double, uh, double dragon with the gouging fire, and this is a really interesting set because it's a covert cloak gouging fire, so no clear amulet and no booster energy because of the sun, and it's how scary face heat crash burning bulwark, so a full support gouging fire and i'm really interested to see just how how it how it works on in this set i wonder if they uh, have a considered sunny day as well because that propped up a bit in i believe regeth as well mm, i think that uh Hengwei made it famous within uh with it within our scene he was pioneering the sunny day gouging fire but it doesn't actually make its appearance immediately we'll see flutterbanes on both sides as the grim snarl is looking across the field at that rillaboom and grassy terrain is set so one of these flutter mains are specs and the other one is protosynthesis with a booster energy so yeah so we know that captain Aura will definitely have the speed advantage with multiple ways of getting control with that icy wind and that thunder wave if not faked out uh, but we have to see what it goes uh goes for and see if the flutter main is scared at all uh, i don't believe it would be because there's no shadow ball on this time and so i feel like it's pretty free to go for a powerful attack uh, I believe we'll probably see a either a ref Oh, never mind. I was about to say we'll probably see a reflector or a light screen, but looks like it switched out immediately into the iron hands. The fake out pressure from the Rillaboom definitely tell him you don't want to use your terror so early um on the Grim Snarl. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense just to be able to reset it and put a bit of pressure. Takes the fake out, a good prediction. Uh, not losing any ground there. However, the dazzling gleam, this is a specs dazzling gleam coming That's in. And I even know. though Iron Hands is tanky. It still does very good damage, it's losing probably about 55 to 60% of its HP. Uh, not exactly the position it wants to be in, but at least can put on some fake out pressure, but risk of a knockout itself. Yeah, this uh, Dazzling Gleam is probably going to be clicked again to just follow up this KO. Like, there's not too much of a reason not to click it here. It's just going to be big damage. And yeah, once the again, there's really, there's really no downsides. Uh, to just staying in and clicking Dazzling Gleam. You do big damage to the Iron Hands if it stays in, you can't get faked out, and this mm -hmm. Flutter main, at worst, it can do is lower your speed, but nowhere near enough for the Iron Hands, surely, to be able to get a Heavy Slam off first. We'll probably see the Rillaboom also follow up with a Wood Hammer into that Flutter main slot. And yet, no priority coming out. Dazzling Gleam just takes out the Iron Hands. You can go Turbo Hands, but even I believe Turbo Hands finds it really, really hard to be able to outspeed even a minus one Flutter main. And that Wood Hammer is a huge hit. It's taken out much bulkier Pokemon than this one, especially Chip Down. I don't think the hit. critical hit matter. I you think sure? the critical hit matter just, 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 just rubbed it in a little bit. I believe <laughs> that uh, the damage cal to, unless it was Max Bold. Um, I don't think that that mattered, and even if no, it was, no, no. it's really it bold. I'm pretty sure it dies either way. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're into a really rough position. Well. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think anything is taking 60% from a neutral wood hammer. Oh, here comes the Terrapagos and the Grimmsnarl. The, um, it's not in the face of any of the fighting types at the very least. Uh, and the terror option is still there to get rid of this grassy terrain. Both yeah, in case uh, he wants to go for it and go double uh, double target in order to actually be able to affect the flutter main, but I think that this feels like a very strong position for um, Anna to be able to just pick up with another attack and reposition. Although with the icy wind, the trap ghost may actually go first. Uh, there's also, I believe, a thunder wave coming out onto the flutter main slot. We saw that as a selection, I believe. So that's true, guaranteeing they want to get it off first. But flutter main is. Definitely very specially bulky, even with the choice specs. This is spread damage. I'm not sure exactly how much it's going to do. They're hoping for a full paralysis this turn. Also, getting rid of that grassy terrain severely neutrals uh, the Rillaboom's output here. Yeah, it's definitely. A huge it's huge amount of damage on both of them. Mm, into a chip, putting them burn to less than 50% uh, on each side. However, this Dazzling Gleam is going to hurt. 
No paralysis, it, and now it's Terrapagos versus the world. Yeah, Terrapagos can do some things, but with just single choice specs, no additional boosters. It'll get the knockouts here because there's no grassy terrain unless Anna wants to switch out. Um, but with what is almost definitely a Crydon in the back, I think that coercion force is going to swiftly end, uh, end the Turtles' day. Yeah, I can assume this one is fully locked up. We can see that Anna has actually taken a bit of time to think about this, just making sure that uh, he sequences it correctly, finds that there's no way to throw this game and see what he can do. Although he does reveal he does reveal. preserve the Rillaboom and show the Coridon, potentially only wanting to keep that fourth Pokemon safe in the back, given that Fluttermane can't protect and not reveal that information. Yes, this keeps at least one Pokemon to not be shown in the back. So leading into the game two, there would be no information for you to make adjustments based on what is that fourth Pokemon. Exactly, and that gives Anna such an advantage. He was able to see exactly what Captain led, how he deal with how he dealt with fake up pressure, and how he dealt with the Splatterman. And I'm not sure if he has the tools uh, to really go far with that one. The potential is as well is you don't want to terror ghost your Grimsaw most of the time because you do want to um, use it for that Terrapagos to get control of weather and terrain. Um, but what's interesting is that the Terra Star Storm single target is so much more powerful than uh, spread damage. Yeah. It is important to note as well, though, that uh, against uh, Coridons, you genuinely don't want to ter terrestrialize the Terrapagos in case you want the collision course to uh, go into that and break the Terra Shell, because otherwise your Terrapagos is not having a fun time. Exactly. I think a lot of the time it really benefits, and I think some of the most experienced Terrapagos players know that it's not as much of a terror hog as everyone else seems to think it is. You can play around it. You can do that big single target damage and clean up in other ways. But I think this is really going to be a tricky matchup. I think that lead was really strong from uh, jo uh, from Anna. I don't think there was too many things that could be stopped by it. Even other leads could protect against any fake out pressure in case that Simon wants to go for Iron Hands as the lead, and I think that, as you're seeing, he might want to be full served by going all into the offense and leading with that Flutter Chiyu duo that we've been seeing all the way back in Reg C. Yeah, having that option to slow down the game and then potentially bar uh, I believe they have Heat Wave on this Chiyu. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's the, it is the same as the Aurelian Sula. It's Terra Ghost, Dark Pulse over heat, heat Wave Protect. If the same leads come out, it's probably a really nice option to just Icy Wind and Heat Wave, both those options. Maybe a fake out comes into that Chiyu, but uh, either way, the following turn, that Chiyu is going to do some work. Definitely, yep. And we see there's no need to make an adjustment on Anna's side, sticking with that Rillaboom and Fluttermane. And this time, we do see as locked in Fluttermane and Chiyu, uh, a duo that's been terrorizing VGC for a year, making an appearance all the way back here in Reg G. Interesting here. Do you think the the Chi you would want to protect? I think there's definitely an argument for it. Be able to uh, see how it goes through, look at how the weather is going to work out later on. The Fluttermane as well has lots of different options. We're going for the Icy Wind for speed control, we're going for the Dazzling Gleam to protect any sort of switch in. And yeah, just safe for the protect, preserving Terra. Don't necessarily need to show it this early. As we see, one is actually coming on Anna's side for that Rillaboom, which is not unexpected. It is Terra. Um, it is Terrifier, so that will be resisting almost every hit apart from the Dark Pulse. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, very nice to make sure that the Chiyu is not immediately knocking out this Rillaboom this turn. Exactly, and the Protect just there, just preserving the Focus Sash, making sure that it lives to fight another day. And here comes the Grassy Glide. I assume that's to cover the, the Terra Ghost option as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no need to fake out into that slot. It's a bit of a risk for not too much reward because you can definitely, with the Terra Resist, every hit, Grassy Glide to break the Focus Sash and potentially um, Dazzling Gleam to knock it out. As we see, Chiyu not at all doing its partner for to any favors as that Dazzling Gleam does a lot of damage. How do you think this turn two will play out? Because uh, now that uh, Rillaboom has terrestrialized, it's still sort of a threat here. It's it's yeah, absolutely. That grassy light is going to do so much damage. With the speed control, I think that you really want to be targeting that Fluttermane that can't protect or anything that comes in with it. And we know that Overheat is an incredibly powerful move, but this grassy light actually does go into the Fluttermane. So we see that the Chiyu will indeed get its move off. 
and it does indeed connect. This fish is wearing its glasses. They're not specs, but they are probably prescription. And that is photamine down. <laughs> That's really important. It was a key piece uh, for Anno. However, there is still a long way to go in this set. That priority from that Rillaboom is going to do so much damage. And as we as we know that it's the Assault Vest, it's definitely going to be incredibly tanky. The only move that can go into it is that Dark Pulse. And one thing that is going to be followed up there is you really want to be maintaining the speed control if you're if you're, if you're the good captain. We do see that the Ogapon uh, half lane here has now made an appearance. Uh, mm -hmm. With the Chiyu at minus two special attack, uh, uh, it's probably quite a an annoying threat. Mm, definitely, it's really really safe here, and this is the double glide strategy that we saw first used in Regi with Ogapon's release and. Both of these Pokemon are going to be hitting extremely hard. Grassy Guard into a Flutter main, knocks it out. This is a powerful real boom. It's got an investment. Um, not for, not led by Grassy Guard from Ogapon. I think it's just going to go for the Ivy Cudgel. Chiyu is not known to be physically bulky, so this still does quite a lot of damage. Yeah, that was a resisted hit, uh, and that heat wave was incredibly sad. I think the one benefit is that Chiyu has hit all three of its targets so far, but now it's a little bit stuck on the field at minus two. And you don't really want to be switching your Terrapagos into it, necessarily. Yeah. It's a bit difficult here, here, how to navigate this Chiyu, because you don't really want to switch it. And you don't really want to keep it on the field at minus two. Exactly. And with the Mold Breaker ability that Ogapon has, the speed control was not found because of that Grassy Glide. And this Ogapon is threatening incredible damage to the Terrapagos at any point that it comes in. Grimstar can slow it down with Reflect, but Ogapon is just such a powerful Pokemon that we, we know that there's really not too many outs for uh, Captain Arrow at this point. Don't know if you see any uh, win conditions in your head. They still have the Terrestrialization option available to them. Uh, maybe a, a potential Thunder Wave later on could help with a Clutch Paralysis on, say, a, what I presume to be the last Pokemon Coridon. Yeah, unfortunately, that Thunder Wave threat is no longer there. That U-turn doing just enough damage, neutral, of course, because of the Dark Fairy typing, and we'll most likely see Coridon set the sun for Ogapon to do some immense damage. Luckily here, I believe uh, Coridon will be the first one to attack, so Terra Shell would not automatically KO. I mean, it would not automatically KO through the Terra Shell. No, that's true. However, I believe the Grassy Train is still on, so that Grassy Glide into Collision Course follow-up is incredibly oh, safe. I don't think that there's any way that uh, Trap Ghost can stop it. There's no Protect to stall out Grassy Terrain turns. That Mold Breaker will... Actually, I'm not sure... Uh, yeah, Mold Breaker from the Grassy Glide the Ogre will ignore the Terra Shell in the first place, so that will do huge damage, taking away the Terra Shell because it won't be at full HP, and this Coridon has a guaranteed Collision Course to do an immense damage. And you can probably safely ignore this GU. Even with this Reflect up Collision Course having that extra damage based if it's based on if it's super effective or not, I think this Terrapagos is going down. Exactly. With all of those multipliers, you have the sun boosting its attack by uh, 33%, and then you have the 33% super effective hit. Um, and the Terra has now gone into Terrapagos, so you can't even Terra Ghost away from it. Realizing that this uh, Terra Shell was not in fact safe. He wants as much bulk as possible, but I don't think it'll be enough. Interestingly, the grassy uh, terrain is now gone, so that option to go for that uh, immediate play where you can... Uh, oh, interesting. It's actually a U-turn. Yeah, this is not uh, the typical Coridon with Flame Charge. It's actually Flare Blitz, Closure Course, and U-turn instead of that uh, other move, which is sometimes Flame Charge, sometimes Dragon Claw, and sometimes Sword Dance. And Rillaboom will come back and reset the terrain. It makes a lot of sense to want to switch it out there just in case they do terrestrialize there, getting rid of that grassy terrain, uh, and then also your sun. So by clicking U turn, you guarantee that you have both your grassy terrain and sun back up. No, definitely. And this is one of those moments where even though you know that you may just have a short route to victory anyway, playing the most optimally, thinking through your turns incredibly well, making sure that you have every single moment of your sequencing right, is what you need to be able to be one of those very top players at the top of the game. Making sure that even when you should really have victory, you do not throw, you do not click the wrong buttons, you take your time, and you see your way all the way to your true win condition. And we did see the Rillaboom switch in there and immediately faint because it was terrestrialized. And 
taking that super effective spec time, which is uh, going to do a lot. Especially with the beads of ruin, but I don't think Anna minded that. He knew exactly what he was doing. He gets the free switch back into Karaidon. It's the fastest thing on the floor, almost definitely. And uh, we'll see exactly how this turn plays out. I'm sure we will see the collision course come out here and potentially KO in. If not, the Ogre Bomb will, will definitely follow it up. Oh, it, it actually survives. Live. That is an incredibly bulky Terrapagos, but with the speed advantage on both Pokemon, Terrapagos just goes away. Uh, the Reflect just about saving it, but um, not for much longer. Considering this uh, Chiyu is minus two, I would say this is uh, this game is over. Oh, oh, a critical hit! That was over here in the sun. That is huge damage, and it may just okay. be one way. I think it's the there other is way. A chance now. I think if uh, the grassy terrain just puts it in just enough range, you protect and you get the grassy terrain again to get out of the uh, out of the way of that ivy cudgel in the sun. You do need uh, another critical hit, probably, to uh, to get yourself out of this situation, because let's not forget that Ogre Bond is mm -hmm. also benefiting from this sun boosted damage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Protect there, just the correct play, gets as much HP as back as possible, um, just to see if you can survive this Ivy Cudgel in the sun. Flicking Ogre Feet, you have to survive this hit. Will it survive this Ivy Cudgel? It does, it does. survive. Now, will the Overheat connect? It does. And this is Overheat in the sun. Is it a critical hit? It is no. not, and surely, surely now, Ooh. Ogre Pond will have it. However, I think there is still an out with a Protect to get enough recovery. That Ivy Cudgel did did do damage. That reflect, reflect coming in so, so handy. I believe there's one turn left of Reflect. It's a bit hard to see on the stream. Um, so maybe it's a bit optimal for the Ogre Pond to click uh, Protect or Spiky Shield here. Yeah, I think, yep, the Chiyu does Protect. gets just a bit more grassy terrain recovering. The horn leech, Oakwan actually going for Horn Leech. Interesting. Trying to get out of range. That could have been very risky. They probably expected the Protect anyway. No reason um, no reason to believe that Captain would do anything else. The guy's trade is now gone. There's no more Protects to get more recovery. It comes down to this turn. Chiyu is at minus six in special attack. Oh. The sun is still up, though. However, Ivy Spiky Shield from Ogapon. Smart. I think that that may be just to stall out the sun so that this overheat, if it doesn't overheat, if it doesn't crit, uh, won't knock it out. However, that's also reducing your Ivy Cudgel damage, and Chiyu might just be out of range. Well, we, as we can see, overheat is uh, on one uh, point as well. So this Horn Leech coming in is definitely going to put this Ogre Pond within range to live this one last overheat because the sun is yeah. up and it's minus One in six. 24 times this KOs. However, it does indeed survive. Unfortunately for Captain Arrow, the reflect is gone. Uh, everything is uh, surely done now. Ivy yeah. Cudgel just wins the game. Yeah, Ivy Cudgel just outspeeds and because the reflect is gone, this GU has no chance to live. No, I don't believe so. I think it was a really well played game by uh, Captain Arrow. Yeah. He definitely, in my opinion, did not have the match of advantage. He did everything definitely that he could. Not. And to even get it back to that stage when we thought it was dead and buried five to six turns ago, uh, is is incredible testament how well he played, and also is important to, and is also important to uh, show just how strong John was. Yeah, though it was a great game, but unfortunately, just having to play Terrapagos into Coridon is never a fun experience. No, definitely not. You do the best with the tools that you do have, but unfortunately, that's what it's like with these single restricted formats, as we've been seeing throughout Reg G so far, is that sometimes you have the matchup and sometimes you don't. And you can play as much as well as you can in order to turn the tide in your favor, but sometimes playing out of your mind turns a 95% into a 65%, and that's just not enough if your opponent is also playing optimally. That is the game. Fanny, did you see any adjustments that you think that uh, Arrow could have made, or do you think that that was the kind of lead that you would have used yourself? I think uh, leaning more into Grim Smile lead. I know it was in game one, but still, it's it's very difficult to win that matchup. Uh, probably have to hack them a bit with Thunder Wave. Uh, but again, the Reflect and Light Stream is also a bit crucial to negate the damage that is coming out. So if yeah, you definitely. lose a Grimmsnarl early, it's it's a bit difficult, honestly. Yeah, and no, I can understand that. He did the best that he could. And I think that one thing that we're seeing is not as popular as before. 
Not as popular as before, but it's the choice for Squad Main. Well, them as Sash now, and they might be Moonblast, Icy Wind, Taunt, or Double Fairy, Icy Wind. But to be able to have that damage from the choice specs really is so much more threatening. Uh, the Grim Snarl can be invested. The Grim Snarl can be invested, but it might not live it. And I think that um, it was an exciting set, but uh, unfortunately kept it. And congratulations to Anno for winning. It was a great set. And I think now we will be moving on to one that I am incredibly excited for. This is 8th pick versus 8th pick. This is Kyra versus Temperamental. Uh, Temperamental being Joseph Hills, known to people um, in the Southeast region as a common site at the Orpington. Re uh, oh, I was going to say Orpington regionals. They basically are regionals. That's how strong the talent is. But um, Funny thing a, a, is, a really good player. Uh, I believe I was his first opponent at Orpington. Oh, that's, yeah. I think... Um, <laughs> That's a, that's a trial by fire, but I'm sure he uh, acquitted himself well. And we are going to go into this set. This is a showdown set, so no cart. Uh, we'll be watching it as we see that from Kyra, they're going to lead a Iron Hands Lungus lead, very common, all the way back for a year and a half, all the way to Reg B, against Miraidon and uh, Shifu. Well, the Lungus immediately does not have the score option because the electric ring is out on the field. So. It's interesting that the fake out comes out and forces my ride on to stop any damage out. So, yeah, and, and with and a critical hit, it. in a critical double critical hit in electric terrain, that fake out did thirty two percent, which is an incredible amount of damage. And Amoongus now just wants to redirect whatever it can. That dragon meteor that's, gets rid of it. That's a dead Amoongus. <laughs> it was uh, not bound for this world. That is a fried mushroom, as the Drain Punch is not very effective into Seasler, especially with that defense boost from the Electric Seed. This Seasler is going to be incredibly fast and hit incredibly hard, and it is also a fake out Taunt Seasler, so it has all of the advantage in this position. Taunting that Calyrex, stopping it from being able to get the speed control. No Trick Room allowed here. No, we'll see if Kyra called it and go with a Glacial Lance, and they did, and single Lance. target even with the defense boost Carolex is just that strong and this battle is progressing at an insane pace with two huge knockouts it is important to note that this Calyrex no longer has the option for click for tech so clicking into that slot is probably mm. very safe now yeah and they go for the draco and another KO. interesting the Calyrex is down for the count amogus and Calyrex are fried and now it's into ditto oh that is incredibly oh. smart incredibly smart this ditto um, is uh, going to be a bit of a nightmare to deal with now, for using its own uh, <laughs> Miraidon against it. Yeah. However, because he used Draco Meteor instead of going for Electro Drift, the ditto actually had half special attack. So if it went into Miraidon, there was the chance it could live. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe this Miraidon is uh, praying for a critical hit now. However, that is the last moment. That Draco does indeed connect, but the Iron Hands is so, so tanky, especially with a special attack drops of minus four, I believe. And that is a swift wrap-up for Kyra. Yeah. Uh, just a note, could we get the replay a bit slower? Because the, the, the pace was a bit fast, I think. Just a bit... Uh... So yeah, now that was an explosive set. I think uh, partially down to the pace of the game uh, and pace of the replay. But what 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 do you think that uh, you liked from Joseph, and what didn't you like from that? Uh, I definitely like the plays he went for. It's just uh, you know the taunt into the Calyrex, like to prevent the Trick Room, was his best option. But still, the the Sneasler wasn't enough. It wasn't bulky enough to take that one Glacial Lance, and that was really unfortunate. If, but it's it. If it did somehow live that, I think the game would have turned out very differently. Yeah, I think that's something that J uh, Joseph can take into the next set, knowing that he can't take that hit. Uh, one interesting thing was that I believe that Fake Out was available, so stopping it with Fake Out for that first turn uh, and letting yourself position could have been the way to go. Um, being able to stop it and not using the taunt, maybe attacking the Iron Hands in the next turn as Maridon takes up Calyrex, but We'll see uh, if this next set is just as explosive. I think it'll be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Fast versus slow, and that Ditto is a menace as well. Even even with half the special attack in the, the uh, electric train. Make a return alongside the Urshifu Dark. Yeah, this is the classic lead, fake out Urshifu. You can hit incredibly hard. And mm -hmm. I believe that both Urshifus are Sash. So even if Fluttermade attacks, it won't do quite enough. Oh, and it's Terra Ghost, Ghost? Maridon. Oh. Incredible. That is a really, really interesting tech. 
stopping the fake out, and I think that this Urshifu is not long for this world, Volt switching out, and that Urshifu is down without doing a single thing. That is a great, great, great play from Joseph, That's... going into Sneasler, getting the boost and unburden. That's a huge uh, advantage right there, because that Urshifu did absolutely nothing. And the Sneasler, again, has that option to click Taunt into this Calyrex. Yeah, Taunt, but I believe that this time he does indeed go for the fake out. Yeah, a smart play. Stopping it from doing anything. Iron Hands, this time, wild charging. Ooh. That is a powerful wild charge, but Maridon is bulky enough to survive it, which is huge. Dire Core into the Iron Hands is to follow up, see if he gets any RNG. No. No, but we do But the Electro drops. Drift is so strong. Iron Hands, and that Drain Punch is not very effective into Sneasler. And if uh, not able to attack. so as the last slot, it won't transform into Maridon because it's not on the right side. Yep, and with that Unburden, it's actually faster than the Choice Scarf Ditto. Going for that close combat, dropping that defense and special defense, but that won't be important in against these two physical attackers. I believe this Iron Hands will die to recall here as well. Yep, and now it is the Ditto up against the Flutterbane and whatever's in the back, and that's a Scarf, uh, uh, sorry, that's a Sash Urshifu. Uh, yeah, um, I believe uh, this is uh, pretty uh, favorable for uh, Joseph here. Yeah, I think with that, with no sleep on the flutter main, this wicked blow, surely enough, it, I believe that even with the, uh, even without the Terra Ghost, that would have done a lot of damage because while Sneasler has 80 HP and 60 defense, Ditto has much, much lower HP and yeah. makes it even more frail. Even with wicked blow resisting there, if they don't Terra, it's still hitting through that plus one defense. So I don't believe it really mattered with the Terra crystallization or not there. Yeah, definitely. I think that was just an incredibly well-played game from uh, Joseph, knowing all the tools that he had available, not risking uh, the taunt on that Maridon with that Terra Ghost. Icy Wind and Volt Switch, getting rid of Eshu before it moved and doing what Maridon does best, hitting and running, um, was just a brilliant turn one. I think that Kira's going to have a lot of things to think about uh, yeah. for this next set. We could see maybe a Sucker Punch come out immediately if we see those Satan leads. Definitely, yeah, that is something that they could consider this time, but as always, it's a, it's a, it's a you-know-that-I-know-that-you-know -know situation. Mm -hmm. It's 50-50s, it's a mind game on every side. Joseph knows that Fake Out could be coming, he knows that Sucker Punch could be coming, he knows that neither could be coming. Uh, well, let's move on to Game 3 and see how it pans out. Yeah, I'm really excited to see this and see if it is a similar lead or not. Iron Hands, once again, as in all previous games, and Urshfu this time, they may be considering that sucker punch. As this time, actually, Sneasler is in the lead with Maridon, getting that unburdened boost and having the faster fake out straight away. Um, yeah. I like this adjustment. It makes a lot of sense that now you can fake out whichever slot you feel like is more of a pressure to whichever uh, flutter main is uh, feeling. Oh, it's a. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a really aggressive move, uh, actually, by Kira not to protect their Eshfu, let that Sash go get broken. And the plus one defense coming in huge for Sneasler Do you as they switch up and on. Eshfu went for a Terra Dark Sucker Punch there. I Into think it might have. I yeah. think it might have. We see the Mimbos yeah. come out, and it just annihilates this Eshfu, regardless. Yeah, no Sucker Punch there. That Eshfu has gone down without doing a single thing in either Game 2 or Game 3. But now well, this is threatening. Punch, this time sorry it goes down doing a single thing <laughs> <laughs> the icy wind comes out and makes this a a speed tie i believe i With think that would have been a speed tie because the scarf would have been negated almost exactly by the icy wind and the ride on wins it and gets rid of the data and now this looks like it is trouble however no. it's Eshfu and flutter versus iron hands and there's the calyrex can the calyrex withstand this Eshfu? that's the question it's a terra terrestrialization of, of Stella. Terra Stella doubles into it. They feel like they had to. Wicked Blow goes in, and that Kyrex is down. Mm -hmm. Iron Hands, however, still has the Quark Drive. They go Drain Punch. All right, they bring Urshu down to Sash, and that could be tricky. And moon I believe blast. a Moon Blast and a close combat because you still have that uh, st Terra Stella boost. Terra Stella boost. That's, mm -hmm. You get one for each stab for 1.5, and that's a clean knockout. Yeah, that was really, really well played and well adjusted by Joseph in games two and three. I think in game one, they made some good plays, but I think that Kyra really countered them really, really well. But knowing that they had that Terra Ghost ride on play, 
really put a lot of fear in for game three and game two was obviously so fundamental that they had a lot to think about and i, I really really liked what i saw from joseph there. It, it was a bit difficult for kira to uh, try and m adjust it because they felt probably confident after game one and game two uh, they definitely did not expect that terror ghost and then they probably expected it again in game three so these calls are always difficult to make it's it is the game right definitely yeah that's why you play three sets because anything can happen anything can uh, go right or can go wrong there could be rog we saw there were double critical hits in game one uh, which potentially could have been a factor um, in some way shape or form um, but they did do very well yeah they did do well with what they had but i think that, that was just so fundamentally well played there wasn't really too much they could do and i think that both players can be really happy with how they showed up on stream today all right, and I believe that we do have a very special next game. This is the <laughs> Bubble Bash. The Bubble Buddies. Uh, yeah, we're serving up a cake with dynamite candles. It is Joe Two Kick Russell versus all of the dynamite girls. And I am so excited to see this. This is Reg F versus Reg F. This is yeah. Uh, Reg F versus Reg F, and uh, I believe that we're going to have a prediction poll versus yeah. uh, Mr. Twelfth, I believe, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Two of them both having their signature Pokemon. Uh, Joe with that Reggie Drago, the Iron Crown, uh, the Crown Town team that he played incredibly well with. And Dynamite is using the famous Iron Boulder and Okie Dokie combo behind Grimmsnarl Springs. So it'll be interesting to see how this pans out because uh, this Reggie Drago seems a bit uncontested apart from the Grimmsnarl. Uh, like. Sh Uh, there should be a prediction in the chat now, so please uh, cast your votes. Yeah, please show who you think is going to win, because this is two of our top players, two Worlds uh, invitees uh, showing out. Hopefully this is an incredible set, and I'm sure it will be. Yeah, as you say, the Reggie Drago does have a lot of targets there. It's only the Goldengo and the Grimmsnarl that are really um, able to face up head on. I mean, is the Goldengo even a, a resist when it's a, a Reggie Drago, to be honest? That is a very, very good point. I mean, when we've got the team pace, we've got it. We, we know exactly what it's called. It's called 12 wins, three losses, Reggie, Reggie Drago did. <laughs> Reginald Dragovich himself. And we're going to get into this as we see uh, from the perspective of Joe. We're seeing Indeedy and we're seeing the Urshifu. And this is a Water Urshifu choice scarf against the Roaring Moon and the Grim Snow from Oliver. It's very interesting here with the psychic terrain going up, denies those options for Thunder Wave on the Grimmsnarl. Yeah, there's no way to slow this Urshifu down right now. And the light screen probably looking for the future, knowing that Reflect isn't actually going to do anything to slow down this uh, Urshifu. And will be interested to see if the Roaring Moon go for damage or if it goes for speed control. And it is just a knock up into ND, knocking it straight out. Uh, and we take that trade. How do, how do, how do you think that was favored? Uh, it's a bit difficult here because uh, that turn one definitely came, comes down to if uh, you predict the Roaring Moon to Terror or not, if you want to click close combat or uh, if you want to click uh, Surging Strikes into the Grim Snarl. And it looks like uh, Dino got the call right there. Yeah, definitely. And we see there's actually the Oak upon Half-Line making an appearance, so no Reflect is going to be real trouble. Ivy Kotal into the Roaring Moon, knocking it out before it can uh, do much. But the Tailwind being set is incredibly strong here. The Iron Boulder, Boulder with a Choice Band and the Goldango boosted. It, it is definitely out. dropping this uh, <laughs> Soak upon here. Yeah, that Mighty Cleave is far, far, far too much to handle. And this Goldango really needs to get this knockout. And, and it, it does. That plus two Shadow Ball definitely invested. That is incredible. Incredible double and knockout, and Dino just seals the game. Forfeit. I believe this is to not reveal the last one. Yeah, definitely. You can uh, definitely save some information there, and I believe that um, no matter which one it was, with the pace advantage that Dynamite had set for himself with that Tailwind, that Roaring Moon's dying breath, bringing the wind behind its sails, letting Goldengo and Boulder finish off the job. Interesting to note that Dino decided to go with the light screen option there in the face of physical attackers. Obviously, Reflect is not going to work too well on against Urshifu because of the Surging Strike crits, but uh, he's definitely respecting that Reggie Drago and uh, Iron Crown in the back. Yeah, definitely. He knows that if Joe brings it and gets, he knows if Joe brings it and gets it into position, it's going to be a real struggle. So being able to do everything it can to slow it down and get some 
Tailwind up. Uh, predicting it to be the next Pokemon out is definitely understandable. Uh, Joe going with the Ogre Pond instead, but we'll have to see how he switches it up in this game two that we're about to get into. It'll be very interesting to see how the, the leads change up this time. And we see again, it's Indeedee and Urshifu. It was a strong first turn up against the Grimmsnarl and the Roaring Moon. Okay, exactly. so same leads. Same we'll leads. see a close combat come out this time to stop this Tailwind from coming up. I guess not. I think there's a chance, but it's Terra Water, it's Helping Hand, it's Surging Strikes. The Reflect, reflect this up. time. And Grimmsnarl will go down once more. There's no way it's going to survive the Terra Water Helping Hand and mm, Reflect doing no. not a thing to this Unseen Fist and the Surging Strikes critical hitting. There's nothing you can really do to stop an Eshifu that wants the Surging Strikes. And there's the, the knock knock off again to KO this Indeedee. All right, so the only difference we see this time is Reflect go up instead of Light Screen, and seeing the Tornadus wanting to make sure that they keep the speed control in their favor. Although, actually, they set the rain, and Goldengo will go down. This Goldengo has that Citrus Berry, and it will live on. Oh, incredible trading from Dynamite, making sure that it's able to live that, and that Citrus Berry coming incredibly handy, because that was a Terra Water Surging Strikes in the rain, and make it rain, finishing it off. Great play from uh, Dynamite to be able to survive that and get into good position. This Roaring Moon looks like it's in a great position here uh, because I believe... Uh, well, I, I was expecting a Tailwind, if I'm honest, with a... Uh, yeah, and that Tailwind is there. However, this is a booster attack Roaring Moon, which means that it wouldn't be able to outpace a lot of things. So that, pri that priority Tailwind lets the Reggie Drago just almost definitely end the game, and I don't think there's anything that can survive it. Iron Boulder's special defense is really high. Uh, I believe a Draco Meteor and a Bleak Wind might be enough to to knock it out. And there it is go. indeed. Yeah. That was a, a great set again. Joe adjusted really, really well there, I think. Actually leaning into the Reggie Drago. We didn't see it make an appearance in game one, and we know that one of these Pokemon, at least, was definitely not there um, to be able to make a difference in the first turn. I think he saw how impactful that Tailwind was for Dynamite in game one and realized that if he didn't match the speeds and didn't get it into his favor, there wasn't really anything he could do. Important to note that I did call out last time that Dino did respect the, the special attackers in the back and went for light screen in game one. But this game, he went for that reflect, even into the face of that Urshifu. It, practically did nothing. If he had that light screen up, uh, the game could have uh, went very differently. Mm, definitely. And I think it's a bit of a call there because, again, Joe knows that Dynamite respected it with a light screen, and he could easily just go and repeat that same turn, mm -hmm. expecting Joe to make a switch. But by going for the reflect, I think he thought that Joe would think about how he would play and go with something a lot more similar and hope that this time that everything was there for him. Uh, maybe this time seeing the Tornadoes, but the same special attacker. But it was indeed Reginald Dragovich, Reggie Drake Goat, <laughs> doing the business for Joe, and I'm sure he's incredibly happy to see it do it. Reggie Drake Goat. <laughs> All right, we're going to go into this game three, see if we have the same leads for a third straight game. It's the Indeedee uh, and the uh, Urshu again. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same leads. And it is the Roy Moon and Grimmsnarl again. I think both of these players know this matchup. They probably practiced against each other back in Regulation F, and they've had some idea how this is going to go. And the Helping Hand, There's no, no terror, terror. And Light Screen is respecting the Reggie Drago. And close combat into Roaring Moon. A huge call. Roaring Moon does not terrestrialize that close combat, gets it immediately. And that means that there is no tailwind and no speed control. So if that Tornadus is in the back, you can go for it with safety. Typically, this uh, indeed he was dropping to this uh, Roaring Moon every time. So now that it's on the field, maybe we'll see it have a different impact. Yeah, definitely. And that reflects actually with it being locked into. Um... Oh, interesting. The Trick Room. Yeah, with a, a uh, close combat coming, but I guess uh, the Spirit Break was enough to just knock out the Urge if you after it, it had those drops. Yeah, with two close combat drops, that reflect also actually coming in very handy, knowing that there was no critical hits coming through. And this will be tricky. There's the trick room there being set was interesting, with no tailwind coming on the other side. I believe it's because he didn't really have much options to go with with the Ndidi, and hoping that maybe this would deny uh, speed control. 
and hoping that uh, code angle would be potentially faster. We do some oh, interesting to come out the and uh, this is destroy Grimmsnarl. Mm -hmm. And now there's three turns of trick room left, and you have to imagine that this half flame is very, very fast. You would have to hope that your your own Ogopon can uh, land a, a good grass move into this into the opposing Ogopon. Because uh, there it is. That there's the case. Terror Water protecting it from uh, the special attacks. However, now this is very interesting. The Goldengo will be slower. The, the, the terrain has expired. That is an important to note. And, the, and there's the make it rain. Goldengo back down to neutral. So now this uh, half flame will probably seal the deal here with an ivy cudgel. Yeah, there's not really too much done what I can do at this point. Terror is used up, and the ivy cudgel, even with a reflect up, that's a super effective hit from a neutral, unintimidated Ogavon half flame. A really, really solid comeback from Joe, and really, really well played to come uh, and adjust from game one to game two, and from game two to game three. Yeah, if you take a note at the, the chat at the bottom there, uh, it looks like uh, there was a, a bit of a romance coming on. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was definitely his issue. I assume that Joe does, in fact, love Oliver. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's carved into a tree somewhere. Potentially. But no, that was really good set. What do you think that Dynamo could have done differently in that game three? Or do you think that Joe just had the uh, had the pressure and the right place to go? I believe uh, he just had the, the game advantage from game two. Having that momentum, it, it's really important getting into Dynamo's head. If you saw that trick room did have some sort of impact there because uh, having your own Ogopon be slower than the opposing one was really important. And then yeah, having definitely. That option to protect and then outspeed the gold and go after to seal the deal. Mm -hmm. I believe that we knew that both Ogopons would have been very fast, but I want, but I think that knowing each other's teams as well as they do, uh, Joe probably realized that maybe. Uh, the training was different, maybe his was adamant, while Joe's was jolly, or maybe they just knew that one was faster than the other in that trick room. He predicted it would be in the back, and that would be really useful. Um, it's one of those moves that sometimes seems confusing, but that's because we're obviously not in their heads. Joe had the plan, and he executed it eventually. The Ogopon... The Ogopon was also quite useful uh, with a follow-me option, in case it, it wasn't used offensively. Um, yeah, definitely. We have a surprise match now. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe this match was announced. I wonder how much people are indeed surprised. It was what the people were clamoring for. It is the, I believe it's been called the Thug Finals. I'm not entirely familiar with why it's been called the Thug Finals. I don't know if they're planning on I'm getting arrested sure in Hawaii, but I do know <laughs> they are planning to get married in Hawaii. This is Ron versus Ali. This is a couple match. We had the Bubble Buddies, and now we have the uh, Hawaiian <laughs> Birds of Love. I'm really excited to see how this goes. This will be uh, one for the ages. I played on Showdown, and I'm wondering if they um, if they played in the same room or if they went to the opposite sides of the bubble. I mean, surely uh, there's no spoon peeking involved, right? No, no, no. Well, there's, uh, I mean, all's fair in love and Pokemon. You never know. <laughs> all right, we see Zama's Entra and Entei versus Tornadoes and Kyogre. And Kyogre switches out immediately. Hmm, that probably indicates Wider Guard. Yes, there's the Wider Guard mm -hmm. option. Uh, Entei is not a fan of being in Sun either, but getting that Snarl off is uh, really impactful into that potential Kyogre. Yeah, and we know that with the Wider Guard, it protects the Entei because this is not the Thunder or a Solvest Kyogre, it's Mystic Water, Double Spread, Ice Beam. And, and the Taunt into the Zama's Enter is really strong with the Protect. Good positioning from Ron. Uh, stopping a wide guard coming out in the future as long as they take care of uh, these two Pokemon as quickly as possible. This does open up Kyogre to come in and now click its water moves because the Zama's Enter is printed. That's true. Uh, they do risk another Snarl and a heavy slam not doing too much damage. It's resisted and Kyogre is really heavy, but the Snarl, Ali recognizing that the special damage from one side was the real threat and anything that came in, whether it was the Fluttermane that stayed or the Kyogre, was going to be heavily impacted and the extreme speed into Tornadoes. I believe we might see a very close to KOing the Zama's Enter here. Yeah. 
And Zamba's entry is incredibly bulky, but it is now low. And we'll have to see the heavy slam actually goes into Tornadus. Now that's taking control of the tailwind, making sure that there's no more speed control into the next turn. The that, taunt ends and White Guard is back online. Zamba's entry did get a speed drop though, so that is quite impactful and taunt has ended. Now, yeah, this gets really interesting. So Terra Grass, so no White Guard coming out. Throat Shock Champau is faster than everything. It didn't get dropped. It does drop the Goldengar. And that origin pulse is a lot of damage, but oh, the terrorgrass allows it to survive. And oh, interesting. heavy slam was interesting, possibly predicting the fluttering to come back in rather than take a big body slam, uh, body press. We see a protect come out from Kyogre, and a wide guard covering that Kyogre's attacking moves. I I, I can only assume. Oh, and that is a critical hit on the sucker punch on the fluttering. A lot of them are bulky enough to live a sucker punch unintimidated from Adamant Pal, so we'll have to see just how impactful that was. But Ron, having done what they could, is still down to just this Kyogre, and Raichu comes in. Uh, the fan favorite, Air Balloon Raichu, is celebrating. It's faking it out, and this Chimpao will just finish the job. Well... That sucker punch definitely uh, did its job. <laughs> you could just you could just hear the complaining from one side of the room to the other. Surely that was a big sucker punch crit. Um, however, I think that Ali did a really good job of managing their resources, realizing where the threat was, snarling when they needed to snarl, wide guarding when they needed to wide guard, tearing when they needed to tear, and just make the right plays overall, recognizing the speeds. Do you think we will see some uh, adjustments with this tornado? Just maybe clicking taunt immediately uh, into this game. Yeah, I think that one thing that we saw there was I think the Tailwind went up immediately despite Ron having the speed advantage from the start with that boost of Flutter. So Taunt going in straight away. Oh, sorry, we're switching in the um, in the Flutter. So a Taunt could be very impactful, letting Kyogre protect and doing that straight away rather than switching up. Uh, I'm just double-checking this Kyogre. Uh, it, it is uh, Water Spout or Impulse Ice Beam Protect with... Uh... Mr. Queen yep. to Terra Ghost. And there we see the move that we were just talking about. It is the Protect from Kyogre, keeping safe, taunting the Zamzenta. So no wide guard, doubling in. That's a great Protect. And now this Kyogre can do a lot of damage, uh, uh, notwithstanding the Sucker Punch. I would like to note that, yeah, the Sucker Punch definitely hampers this uh, Kyogre's damage output severely. Yep, that is a very powerful Champau, almost definitely adamant in nature, and it does survive with a Focus Sash and that Body Press getting rid of Kyogre. That really swings things. I think that that was a great turn. A Terra Steel great... option was definitely interesting there, though. Oh. Yeah, I believe they were trying to survive the Heavy Slam, however, it didn't quite work, but Landorus comes out. That That's a great adjustment into this uh, Zamazenta because you can both target it with a Bleak Wind and a Power to get a double potential knockout. And it lives. But this Zamazenta is especially bulky as well. And that body press takes, takes out Tornadoes. That is huge. There's no priority blocking here from Ron. Um, a Frigoraf would be incredibly handy, or a Serena in this situation. But now that Sucker Punch is free to come out from Champau. Um, but both Pokemon are very low. And we'll have to see what's in the bag. I believe it's still free for Flutterman to click Moonblast and an Earth Power. It should secure you with two knockouts here. Or even it was actually fire. Mystical Fire Flutter main. Another damage reduction option, uh, super effective into grass, and then, yeah, Sludge Bomb goes into Chen Pao. The Sucker Punch could only attack one target, and that was just not going to be enough. I think even with a fiddle hit, the Landris is probably just about bulky enough to survive. We do see uh, the Raichu and the Entry come out here with that fake out option. Uh, it's probably not what you want to see on your Landris uh, potentially dying this turn. No, that was very, very risky to not protect the Landorus with the fake out pressure. And that Snarl is going to be doing so much. And Entei, we now know, has extreme speed pressure. So this Landorus may not be long for this world. Yes, I, I believe uh, this Landorus can't really do much here. We're in the face of extreme speed. It should definitely be within range. And this Raichu uh, can continue to just do its thing on the Flutter main. That's it. Now, the Raichu is bulky, um, even with the. <laughs> Even without an Assault Vest like Wolf popularized, it took it very easily from a minus one Flutter main. There's no damage that can affect the Entei, and I think this game is surely wrapped up as soon as Entei wants to end it. Mm -hmm. That nuzzle uh, coming in for that Paralysis here, and uh, I'm sure Entei's going to fire off a, a Stab Fire option here. 
Yep, definitely. If the Sacred Fire hits, it will knock out. And yeah, there it is. Burning Passion in the in real life, Burning Flames from the NTA to win this game and win that set. Really, really well played um, by uh, Ali. I think that that was just really strong. Knew exactly what they were doing. Knew how they needed to sequence their actions. Knew what was important for Vaughn and how to manage the resources to stop it. Uh, hope uh, uh, that both of these uh, participants enjoy their time. Uh, Hawaii and have a, an excellent time together uh, in life. It's yeah, really I'm sure that special to tie the knot with someone. Absolutely. Now, congratulations. I'm sure that they really enjoyed their time with this. I'm sure that everyone enjoyed seeing this battle, and uh, congratulations to them. I'm hoping there's many more practice games in the future and uh, a lot more Pokemon too. But um, I really hope that everyone was really excited to see that and get to see a very special match uh, ending up here. Well, I believe. That is all of our games for today. Yeah, everyone, that's all for it. Hope everyone's enjoyed the games. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I'm not really sure if, if I personally did a good job, but I'm sure <laughs> I did. I, so. yeah, thank you. No, 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 you did, you, you did great. Really, really thank you, uh, Fabi, for joining us. Thank you to Joshua for getting all this on. Thank you for watching. Um, definitely some issues today, but what is UKIT without Cenk? Uh, I really hope that everyone enjoyed how well we could uh, get a load of those battles. Um, confusion in parts, but a lot of excitement there. Some great, uh, great storylines, great battles, and great play. I think it really showed off again just how strong everyone is from top to bottom. Our eighth pick match versus eighth pick match was really, really strongly played from both players, and we got to see our bubble buddies, and we got to see our uh, soon to be married couple. It was a, re a really great day for me. What would you say is your highlight from this uh, set of stream games? Um, that is very difficult. I think the one turn, the Terra Ghost Icy Wind Vault Switch was an amazing turn. I thought that was special. Uh, and also being able to see this uh, this final game and put it on as a surprise. So I really love that too. Yeah, I would say uh, the, the slideshow was definitely interesting. Uh, having to predict what our own players were clicking was a, a bit of a nightmare. And yeah, it's not normal that you have to make predictions as the caster rather than the player playing. But we lost some of those 50-50s, we won some of those 50-50s. But I think that hopefully it was entertaining for everyone regardless. I hope everyone had a good time. And I hope that everyone uh, has fun playing the matches this week and tunes in next time for another stream next Sunday, hopefully with less foul points, more uh, fast-paced action. And please make sure to give some love to those casters as well. Yeah, no. And uh, one final thanks to Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. Really great job, despite the circumstances. Uh, hope everyone has a great evening, and uh, come on, England. Come on, England. <laughs> it's coming home. <laughs>